So hello everyone. We'll briefly go through some of the recall questions that we have. We don't have all the options for the answers, but more or less we have questions to frame around our answers. Uh, I was uh, not too surprised to see the questions. A lot of these questions were already covered, but the problem is uh, since we have such a concise package, uh, a lot of you know answers to the questions are in the sentences and not in the notes or in the slides, right? So. What I speak, probably some of those questions had answers in the way I explained some of the concepts, but most of the things looked covered. So starting with the first question, treatment of Clostridium difficile, some history was probably given. So confusion is usually between the root of vancomycin. So it's always oral. And before I like, uh, you know, move on, let's just quickly or briefly review what is the latest guidelines for management of uh, Clostridium difficile infection. So this is from 2021, pretty recent. And uh, what you have to note here is if the options mention Fidoxamycin, then Fidoxamycin is the answer for uh, treatment of choice of Clostridium difficile first episode. Alternative treatments include oral vancomycin, and if vancomycin is not available, sometimes it is not available, then metronidazole can be given orally. So in terms of medications that are used for Clostridium difficile infection, fidoxamycin and vancomycin are always oral. Metronidazole is preferably oral, but sometimes in fulminant Clostridium difficile infection, we give an additional metronidazole to vancomycin or fidoxamycin, which is given IV. So we'll just uh, see it. So if a patient has a recurrence, then what we do is, again, we repeat the same treatment course, but a lot of times the people would do a tapered and pulse regimen of vancomycin that I've highlighted. I'll not go into like details of everything, but just important points I'll keep on highlighting. And other potential MCQ point is the role of bezlodoxumab. So it's an antibody against toxin B. This is also we have already covered in our regular classes. So it's an adjunctive treatment. It's not like the only treatment that we give for C. diff infection. If it's available, it is given in addition to the antibiotic therapy that we do for Clostridium difficile. Now, in terms of second or subsequent recurrence, what is important to note is in addition to vancomycin, there's also a role of uh, rifaximin and fecal microbiota transplantation. And fecal microbiota transplantation is usually recommended once there are more than three episodes of C. difficile infection. Last point is fulminant C. difficile infection. How do we define fulminant C. difficile infection if the patient looks septic? There's leukocytosis, AKI, ileus, hypotension. Then it's a fulminant CDI. And in that case, we do a combination treatment and the vancomycin doses are higher. So everywhere else we are using 125 four times. Fulminant CDI, we are using 500 milligrams four times. In addition, we can give the intravenous metronidazole or a enema of vancomycin. So that is what you need to keep in mind. So that's with respect to Clostridium difficile infection in brief. Just to, uh, you know, just to brush up your uh, antibiotics causing C. difficile infection, what we have to keep in mind is the frequently associated one and the rarely associated one, because the questions would be framed around these antibiotics, which of them ca can cause uh, C. diff and which of them are not associated with C. diff. Occasionally associated is not very important from exam perspective. Next question I think was related to some CSF findings. I don't know what the exact picture was, but I'm assuming it would be an India ink preparation because that is the most common modality done on uh, CSF fluids. And what you see on India Inc. is basically in a dark background, you will see the yeast cells. So these yeast cells are characterized by this halo around the yeast cell, which is uh, because of the capsule. So this is very characteristic of uh, cryptococcal infection in CSF. I've just added two more slides. Uh, this is a gram stain preparation of cryptococcus, just in case next time they ask a gram stain thing. So they overall, cannot be classified as a gram positive or gram negative organism. Uh, they have, you can see these gram positive inclusions in them. And then there is a gram negative or the pinkish halo around the cells. So that is how it would look on uh, gram stain. And the third important staining for cryptococcus is mucic stain. 
which is considered kind of very sensitive or specific for cryptococcal infections. Here you can see the pink, uh, you know, pink yeast cells in a uh, yellow background. So if you're seeing a yellow background, pink circular structures, then most likely it's music carmine stain and cryptococcal infection. Next is induction treatment of cryptococcal meningitis. I think there was a question on what is the treatment of choice for uh, induction in cryptococcal meningitis. Important point to highlight here is there has been a recent guideline based on the ambition trial that was published in NEGM last year. So based on that, WHO has revised the induction treatment for cryptococcal meningitis. So what we had discussed earlier during our regular classes was we do a two weeks of liposomal amphotericin B with flu cytosine. This is what most textbooks still carry, but there has been a change in the guidelines with respect to induction treatment only. Consolidation and maintenance remain the same. So what is the update in cryptococcal meningitis induction therapy? Now they say a single high dose of liposomal amphotericin B. So the first dose is going to be a 10 milligrams per kg of liposomal amphotericin B. And that's it. That's the liposomal amphotericin B now patients are supposed to get with 14 days of flu cytosine and fluconazole. So we do one dose of liposomal amphotericin B 10 milligrams per kg and then 14 days of flu cytosine and fluconazole in the given doses. This becomes the induction and then we go back to consolidation and maintenance with fluconazole as it was earlier. This is, I am not going to read this. You can maybe just screenshot it, see it later. These are all the alternative induction regimens. Uh, most likely questions won't come for, from alternative regimens because it is too much to remember. What is important is the induction therapy and the recent update. Next is antibiotic in native valve endocarditis. Now this I feel is a uh, not a great question because uh, the focus is more and more on diagnosing the cause of infective endocarditis. Most guidelines would just say, you know, start an antibiotic cover staph streptoenterococcus for native valve endocarditis or late prosthetic valve endocarditis. And almost 90%, like as per literature, 80 to 90% cases will have a positive culture. And then they switch to uh, organism specific endocarditis management that we have already discussed in our regular classes. But this gives us an opportunity to discuss the most recent guidelines from European Society of Cardiology 2023 guidelines, where you'll see this table 10, which is for recommendations for antibiotic regimen for initial empirical treatment of infective endocarditis before pathogen identification, right? So what is included in this? There, it includes community acquired native valve endocarditis or late prosthetic valve endocarditis, which is more than 12 months from the surgery. And what they are saying is, you give ampicillin in combination with ceftriaxone or flucloxacillin with gentamicin. So ampi, ceftriaxone, gentamicin or ampi, flucloxacillin, cloxacillin and gentamicin. Now, practically what is done is, mostly what is done is vancomycin, gentamicin is considered to be empirical choice treatment. But if you look at up-to-date recommendations, the up-to-date mentions that only vancomycin is enough. However, we'll go by guidelines, whatever the guideline says, whatever is the most recent one. So if the option mentions ampicillin, ceftriaxone, gentamicin, that's the answer. If it is mentioning vancomycin plus gentamicin or cefazolin plus gentamicin, you can choose either. But the focus in infective endocarditis management is more and more on directed therapy rather than, you know, uh, empirical therapy. Next is, this is also something we have covered in our classes, treatment for endocarditis caused by Coxiella brunetti. So Coxiella brunetti is one of the organisms that, that causes culture negative endocarditis. And uh, what we had discussed is the treatment is doxycycline plus hydroxychloroquine. Duration is very long, usually more than 18 months, depending on how the patients respond and, you know, change in serology tests. Now, again, this is from the 2023 European Society Cardiology Guidelines. Just keep in mind, take a screenshot. These are the common organisms for culture negative endocarditis. At one go, you can just, you know, remember for treatment for Brucella, Coxiella, Bartonella, et cetera, even Trophorima Whipley. I think one of the questions was related to Whipple's disease management. 
and the treatment would be doxycycline hydroxychloroquine i'll come to uh, whipple's disease management later but uh, this is an important table to keep in mind and the next table to keep in mind is treatment choices for hasec group of organism now since we have had one question this time for coxiella so there could be questions revolving in and around the other culture negative organisms or something like hasec so the treatment of choice usually is ceftrax on 4 weeks but if you look at uh, esc guidelines or even aha guidelines alternative treatment options are ampicillin with gentamicin and ciprofloxacin but mostly everybody is going to say ceftriaxone if ceftriaxone is in the options then ceftriaxone is the answer for hasec group of organisms next question was related to treatment of latent syphilis with cns involvement this was again we had discussed this is one of the slides from our regular classes so treatment of syphilis what we want to classify is whether it's an early syphilis or early latent syphilis late latent with cardiovascular or other organ uh, other organ involvement and then we have to classify neurosyphilis separately because the management changes so for early disease or early latent syphilis it's a single dose benzathione penicillin right and for late latent or even with cardiovascular involvement what we are doing is three weekly doses so one dose of benzathione penicillin every week for three weeks that is the treatment but if it is neurosyphilis or there is ocular involvement what we do is crystalline penicillin 24 million units every day into four days so it is given in divided doses four hourly or six hourly divisions into 14 days now sometimes it is difficult to get crystalline penicillin so in those cases even ceftriaxone for 14 days or doxycycline can be considered as uh, al uh, reasonable alternatives to penicillin therapy but for your question and answers uh if it is neurosyphilis the answer is crystalline penicillin and not benzathione penicillin for 14 days uh, in neurosyphilis next question was related to listeria meningitis now when we discuss meningitis under the infectious diseases module we didn't go into like a lot of details but what i had included is this table now empirical management is quite straightforward for meningitis cases most patients would get ceftriaxone and vancomycin if there's suspicion for hsp people start acyclovir empirically but what was important is an area for question was these organisms right so the first one is listeria monocytogenes and the treatment was asked for it treatment of choices ampicillin alternative is cotrimoxazole so that was the question that was asked again good opportunity to you know go through this table just keep in mind what are the other uh, uncommon atypical causes of meningitis what are the clinical features geographical distribution and treatment of choice for these uh, causes next important point is duration of treatment for meningitis in general so most of the meningitis treatment would be within like 2 weeks 2 to 3 weeks but for listeria the treatment is usually longer it could go greater than 3 weeks so it also depends on uh, how well the patient is responding to treatment but in general 3 weeks is the minimum duration you do for listeria monocytogenes meningitis next question was related to contact fever again something we had covered now they had asked about correct statement i'm not sure if all the options that are labeled were correct because to me two statements are correct now influenza like illness without pneumonia is definitely correct and it is also gram negative bacillus so this is also correct a and c are wrong so we'll just quickly go through contact fever again contact fever mimics which of the following so it mimics a flu like disease and it is caused by legionella species so this is what we discussed that contact fever is a several day long non pneumonic febrile influenza like illness associated with exposure to legionella right so this itself answers that it's a non pneumonic disease and it's an influenza like illness next out was related to incubation period okay so we'll just quickly go to the incubation period so you will see it is 2 to 10 days for legionnaire's disease but it's only few hours to 3 days for contact fever the option was 5 to 7 days incubation period for contact fever which is wrong because it is more like a exposure and then you know kind of a hypersensitivity kind of a thing 
So within few hours to maybe a day or two, patients will develop contact. And it's the pneumophilic strain, but it does not cause pneumonia. It causes flu-like illness in patients. So that is contact fever. Management-wise, it is, uh, again, uh, diagnosis and all, I'll not go into detail. Management-wise, it is either macrolides or doxycycline uh, can be preferred. Even fluoroquinolones for severe disease can be preferred. Next question was related to drug resistance. Now, Ambler class A, B, and D, I think they had asked for which of the drug combinations will be effective against Ambler class A, B, and D. Uh, this particular example we have discussed in our class, briefly going through the types of uh, or the classes of uh, enzymes that can cause beta-lactam resistance, the class A, B, C, and D. Class B is atypical because it's a metallo-beta-lactamase, highly resistant, but it is susceptible to astronomy. And what does ceftazidime avibactam do? So avibactam is a newer generation beta-lactamase inhibitor, and it is active against class A, class C, and class D, but OXA type, OXA-48 type only. So the question had asked class A, B, and D. Even if it said class A, B, C, and OXA-48 type of class D, the answer would still be ceftazidime avibactam astronaut. So the logic is ceftazidime avibactam will act against class A, C, and D, OXA-48 type, and astronaut will act against class B, right? So ceftazidime avibactam plus astronaut combination is kind of a polymyxin sparing therapy for carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae. What is important to remember is this combination does not work against Acinetobacter species. And this combination works against Pseudomonas, but it's not the best combination against Pseudomonas. So, Ceftazidime, Avibactam, Astronom is a good combination against Carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae only in general. We do use it for Pseudomonas, but it's not the best treatment and it is not effective against uh, uh, Acinetobacter. So we don't use it against acinetobacter. Next question was cocobacilli, gram negative, non-glucose or non-lactose fermenting and oxidase negative. Now, I think this is not the best question to ask in a neat SS because it's more to do with microbiology. But what I want to highlight is uh, some of the characteristics of acinetobacter. So a cocobacilli, a gram negative cocobacilli is usually acinetobacter. They are non-fermenters and they're oxidase negative. What is oxidase positive on the other hand? Pseudomonas is oxidase positive, but it's not a cocobacilli. It's a uh, proper gram negative bacilli. It doesn't look like a cocobacilli. Just to highlight one important point. So if you look at oxidase test positive wise, what we are interested in is pseudomonas. So if it is positive, we are interested in pseudomonas. But if it's negative and say, the next exam, they just want to make it a little more difficult for people. So you, what other organisms are non-lactose fermenters and, you know, can be oxidase negative? So Acinetobacter is there, right? The, it can also have stenotrophomonas and burkholderia. Now, these can be further, you know, identified based on biochemicals, but I'll not go into details. What is important to notice? Sometimes antibiotic susceptibilities can help the lab in identifying these organisms. For example, uh, Burkold area will be polymyxin resistant. Acinetobacter will be polymyxin sensitive. Burkold area will almost, almost always be sensitive to cotrimoxazole, right? Phenotrophomonas will be sensitive to cotrimoxazole. It is variable sensitivity to polymyxin, and it is usually sensitive to carbapenems, right? So we'll not go into detail, but what you have to remember is three, though there are two more organisms like Stenotrophomonas and Burkholderia, along with Acinetobacter that are oxidase negative. But when we are talking of oxidase positive organisms, it's mostly Pseudomonas. Next is Candida. I don't know what the exact question was. Probably it was related to drug sensitivity, whether it's correct or incorrect. This is something specifically we have discussed in our regular classes. So going by the species again, Candida glabrata is known to have higher MICs for echinocandins, but not echinocandin resistant. 
Other point is there is cross resistance between fluconazole and voriconazole. So if it is fluconazole resistant, it is almost always voriconazole resistant also, right? So that is cross resistance in glabrata for fluconazole and voriconazole. Next species is cruzi or cruzi. There is no cross resistance between fluconazole and voriconazole. So it can be fluconazole resistant, but it is usually voriconazole sensitive. Next is lucitiny, which is amphotericin resistant. Gilermondi is decreased susceptibility to echinocandins and fluconazole. And most important is candida oris, which is multidrug resistant. Now, although I've written a zole plus minus ampho plus minus echinocandin, if you have to choose in your exam, then echinocandins most of the times retain activity against candida oris. So candida oris, can be considered resistant to azoles, amphotericin B, and can be considered sensitive to echinocandins in general practice, but it is highly variable, right? But for exam purpose, what you can consider is candida oris to be echinocandin sensitive and resistant to other. Next, T above MIC, like PIPTAS, so it was probably related to time-dependent killing versus concentration-dependent killing. This we had covered in the miscellaneous MCQs. So just again to highlight which antibiotics have time-dependent killing, beta-lactams, clindamycin, azithromycin, and linozolid. So piptazo, piptazolin, tazobactam is a beta-lactam. So what we want is time greater than MIC. Like we want uh, the, MI, the, the drug levels to be above MIC for a greater period of time. Whereas for concentra concentration dependent killing, what we want is a higher concentration. Uh, it does not matter if the MICs quickly come down below the uh, desirable MICs, but what we want is it should quickly go up. So amikacin, fluoroquinolones, metronidazole, and quinfristin, dalfopristin are concentration dependent. So again, time and again, these questions keep coming time dependent versus concentration dependent killing. The next question that was asked is related to post-antibiotic effect of aminoglycosides. Now, this will lead to reduction in frequency of dosing. I'm not sure what the other options are, but this one looks to be the correct answer. So what is post-antibiotic effect? It is persistent suppression of bacterial growth that occurs after the drug has been removed in vitro or cleared by drug metabolism and excretion in vivo. So even when the drug has been eliminated, the drug, it will still have some antibiotic effect. So it is mostly described for aminoglycosides against gram-negative bacilli and also staph aureus. And the duration of post-antibiotic effect for aminoglycosides is between one to seven and a half hours. So important point, aminoglycosides, gram-negative bacilli, also staph aureus. And because of the post-antibiotic effect, we can dose the antibiotic less frequently. So first, it is concentration-dependent killing for aminoglycosides, plus they have a post-antibiotic effect. So that's why we can uh, dose it once daily. Next question was uh, probably a history was given where there's a sexually transmitted disease with papular lesion, no lymphadenopathy, and easily bleeds on touch. So this is a classical description of denovenosis. So this is a table from Harrison of genital ulcers, which you have to kind of, you know, remember. What are important points you have to remember is presence and absence of lymphadenopathy and pain or painless ulceration. So that kind of gives us a clue for most of the differential diagnosis. Um, what is important to notice, for first three differentials, the treatment duration is usually either one dose or maximum three doses. But for LGV and donovanosis, usually the treatment is longer. So we give doxycycline for three weeks. Uh, causative organism, chancroid is hemophilus ducri. Lymphogranuloma venerum is uh, chlamydia, trachomatosis, trachomatis. And donovanosis is caused by Klebsiella granulomatosis, which was earlier called Calimatobacter granulomatosis. Any which way, I mean, these could just come up as MCQs. Uh, so just to remember those important points, very important to remember this table. This I wanted to highlight, maybe it's not legible, but you have to go through this kits, you know, in details, just try to remember them. Uh, there are seven kits usually 
for uh, based on urethral cervical or vaginal discharge genital ulcers herpetic versus non herpetic inguinal lymphadenopathy and lower abdominal pain so this is what you have to remember also in addition to you know uh, i mean uh, in addition to reading the top part of this whole thing also remember to read the bottom line because it talks about the treatment of partners that is also very important so treatment of a lot of stis is incomplete without treating partners because there will be recurrent exposures and you will probably not see success in treatment very important point to screen partners wherever it is indicated and then treat the partners so that is with respect to uh, sti management in general and uh, okay so this is what i was talking about ataxia chronic diarrhea with uh, you know myorrhythmia now it is very classically seen with uh, whipple's disease we haven't discussed whipple disease in our module because we were not talking about chronic diarrhea most likely it was covered in uh, the gastrointestinal system but talking briefly about whipple's disease it's a multi system disorder which is classically characterized by joint pains which might be the first symptoms weight loss uh, diarrhea you know and uh, so these are the usual symptoms with uh, whipple's disease they're not very common they're in rarely you know diagnosed mostly on biopsy where they do pass staining and you'll see the organisms which are ps positive for adic acid soap stain treatment wise what i want to highlight is so if the option mentions ceftriaxone followed by cotrimoxazole so that is the first treatment of choice but if the option does not mention ceftriaxone and cotrimoxazole then your treatment becomes doxycycline plus hydroxychloroquine uh, treatment duration what they suggest is initial 2 weeks of iv so you do 2 weeks of iv ceftriaxone except for when there is endocarditis where you want a longer iv treatment once you complete the iv treatment then you start the uh, cotrimoxazole suppression which will go on for probably one year so that's in brief about whipple's disease i think these were all the questions that we had from the infectious diseases section there might still be some overlap because uh, you know like infectious diseases is not like a single system subject so there might be overlap with uh, you know other subjects so you should just follow all the discussions on mcq from other faculty as well so that's it i think uh, yeah i don't have any more slides